Good morning, everyone. We're going to try to get started. I know there's still a lot of people coming in, but, uh, but we want to make sure we have enough time here for the event. Um, welcome, everyone, to the New York Hedge Fund Roundtable September event. I'm Adam Weinstein. I'm president of the New York Hedge Fund Roundtable. Uh, we're thrilled that everyone's here this morning. Uh, please remember to turn off notifications from your mobile phones and PDA devices. Uh, the press is in attendance this morning, and so this discussion will be on the record. Now on to our main Thank event. You. So we're thrilled to have with us this morning uh, Leanne Cooperman, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Hedge Fund Omega Advisors, which has more than three and a half billion of assets under management. After completing an MBA at Columbia, Mr. Cooperman began his career in finance in the investment research group at Goldman Sachs. In his 25 years at the firm, he held various positions and eventually went on to help set up the firm's asset management unit, which he oversaw as chairman and CEO before leaving to start Omega Partners in 1991. In addition to being a force within the hedge fund industry, Mr. Cooperman and his wife are active philanthropists and have signed on to the Bill Gates and Warren Buffett's Giving Pledge. Like all of you, I'm eager to hear, uh, to hear Mr. Cooperman's thoughts on the alternative investment industry. Today's event is going to be moderated by Michael Padanella, a partner at Grant Thornton, where he serves as the firm's national asset management sector lead. Without further ado, and, and again, uh, to make sure we have time for the content of today's meeting, I'll turn it over to Mr. Patanella to get, get us underway. Thank you, Adam. Uh, good morning, everyone. And Lee, thank you again for uh, coming to speak with us today. Um, welcome to Grant Thornton's uh, house, New York office, and we're uh, happy to host today. Um, Adam gave a, a very brief background of your background, but I'd like to ask maybe just before we get into the business of hedge funds, maybe you talk a little bit about um, your career. I know I've read something about you maybe wanting to become a dentist and some of the, the terms that you took to get to uh, Goldman Sachs. Let me just first say it's a pleasure to be with you. I'm flattered that you think I have something to say that's worthwhile. <laughs> and I will be honest with you, meetings like this are as valuable to you as the following your questions. So you will be the key <laughs> determinant that this is a good meeting for you guys or not. Uh, I, I didn't I talk about that. It, it's an interesting lesson, you know, but uh, back in the 60s, if you completed your major and minor in college in three years, it allowed you to count your first year of uh, dental, dental or medical school toward your fourth year of college and you had a separate degree. So in the summer of 1963, I took uh, physical chemistry at the University of Pennsylvania, finished up my major, which was chemistry, my minor was math and physics, and I enrolled in the University of Pennsylvania Dental School. And after eight days, I started to wonder if I was pushing myself in the direction I was totally committed to. And we all could laugh about it, but it was uh, you know, a very heroic decision on my part, because you've got to keep in mind, I paid tuition for a year, I paid room and board. My father, may rest in peace, would walk around saying, my son is a dentist. <laughs> all my friends knew me to be in dental school. I drilled my initials LC into all the equipment. They tell you things disappear in the laboratory, so put your initials on your equipment so you know it's yours. I had to go to the dean of the dental school and tell him that I wanted to go back to undergraduate school. And he put me on a guilt trip saying I deprived the 101st applicant for the dental education. I wasn't smart enough at that time to realize you just could call somebody in the wait list after eight days and bring them in. The only guy that really understood the trauma I was going through was the dean of Hunter College, who had to approve my matriculating back into school. I went back to Hunter. I had all elective because my major and mine was complete, and I took 10 courses in economics, got 10 A's, never looked back. And so uh, my son, uh, I have a son who graduated Phi Beta Kappa at Stanford, his best job offer was the two-year analyst program at Goldman. And I told him, this is indentured servitude, I don't think it's for you, but he took it. And after four months, he came to see me and he said, this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> they, they haven't given me a day off in four months. They called me up in the middle of the night to come into the Xerox presentation booklets. This is not what I got a fly paid a cap and degree in. And they quit. And so I said, just do me a favor. Uh, tell the guy who runs the training program you're unhappy, excuse my back here, that you're unhappy, um, and uh, he's not going to care, but at least he'll protect himself with this, you know, senior who's when he reports every week as to what's going on with the trainees. You can say, Cooper doesn't seem all that happy. Number two, you have to understand, you have to support yourself. I'm not going to support you. Number three, you would have to ask my opinion, which you've already done, 
And then before, uh, I told him that my dad was Phil's parents. And my whole philosophy of life is, you know, you had to do what you love, love what you do, and uh, he found his way. I mean, he's smarter than me because he just retired and became a family office after running a hedge fund for 20 years. I'm still slugging it out. So, <laughs> so uh, but that's the dental school story. Turning my back at it, and I take the liberty, if you wouldn't mind, uh, I had uh, dinner with Warren Buffett in September of 2010, and uh, when he solicited me for the giving pledge, and I knew what I was going to do independent of him because it's like a gambling junket. You don't go to Las Vegas uh, without the attention of gambling. I'm not a guy, I don't go to Las Vegas because you have people looking over your shoulder and trying to get into the tent. So if you go to dinner with Buffett and you know what he's asking for, and you kind of make your mind up before you even go to the dinner. So I wrote him a letter, I'll read it to you. It's really it's my narrative, it's my story. I've lived the American, um, the American dream. So I said, uh, Dear Warren, Toby is my wife, we've married 53 years. And Toby and I very much enjoyed our dinner with you, Bill, Melinda, and Mayor Mike. That's Mike Bloomberg. The graciousness of the mayor's hospitality is matched only by the interesting guests and the quality of the dinner conversation. The concept of the giving pledge is intriguing and meritorious. The fact that Toby and I are even candidates to make the pledge is a testimony to the American dream. Uh, I get a little sentimental. Let me explain. Uh, I'm the son of a plumber who practices trade in the South Bronx and the first generation American born in my family, as well as the first to get a college degree. My education is largely public school based. The fact of the matter is, uh, I walked grade school, high school, and college. Okay, uh, I went to PS 75 in the South Bronx, Morris High School in the South Bronx, and then I went west, I filed all his greedies with advice to the west young man, and went to the West Bronx, and went to Hunter College. I had a short stint at the Columbia University Graduate School of Business where I earned an MBA and that opened the door to me, uh, for me to Goldman Sachs. I joined the firm the day after graduation, I graduated January 31, 67, and a National Defense Edu Education Act student loan, had no money in the bank, I had a six month old kid, so I couldn't take a vacation, I went to work the next day. I started my career going in February 1 of 67. Um, um, I had a near 25 year run of happiness and good fortune at Goldman Sachs the last 19 years, now 26 years, uh, uh, at Omega have been years of happiness and good fortune with a few bumps along the way. While I worked hard, I must say I had more than my share of good luck. Uh, Toby and I feel it is our moral imperative to give others the opportunity to pursue the American dream by sharing our financial success. The case of philanthropy has been stated by others in the most articulate way in the words that impressed me. Uh, in the early 1900s, the Andrew Carnegie said, he who dies rich dies disgrace. In the 1930s, Sir Winston Churchill observed, we make a living by what we get, but we make a life by what we give. In 1961, President John F. Kennedy, in his inaugural address, stated, that's not what your country can do for you, that's what you can do for your country. <coughs> well before all these gentlemen expressed their thoughts, it was written in the Talmud, a man's net worth is measured not by what he earns, but rather what he gives away. And it was in that spirit that we agreed to take the given place. So, you know, I, I'm really, uh, I'm actually a member of the Ratio Outer Association of self made people, but I've lived the American dream. I've been very, very lucky. That's a great um, detailed history, and I appreciate you sharing that. Um, one of the things that, in researching for today, I thought was interesting, along with the dentist uh, portion of it, was how you left Goldman Sachs and why, after you came up the ranks, um, in 25 years. Maybe you could just give a little bit of... Yeah, I had a wonderful career at Goldman. I love my experience there. I never would have left. You know, um, I had a lot of energy. Um, uh, it came to me, I think it was in 1989. It was in my, this was my It came in 1989. I was an... To show you how little influence I had for my I had a big smile. Uh, I was telling them for a decade they were making a mistake by not doing an asset management. <coughs> for a decade they told me, you don't get it. Uh, we're in the belief brokers should do brokers, money managers do money management, don't confuse your customer. They had this great fear that you know you walk in to make a presentation to solicit a new client and next to you would be sitting uh, you know, Dreyfus or Tiro Price soliciting the same client and they, they start to say, well, why would we do this with Goldman Sachs if Goldman's competing with us? I said, wake up and smell the roses, look around there. It was the uh, you know, uh, Arc Asset Management Division, Lehman, Webster Division of uh, uh, Peabody, uh, CSFP. Everybody was in the business, Safe Solomon. 
one day they announced to a very dear friend of mine, uh, who's an investor with my fund actually, many years later, Bob Stallman Jr. was leaving the research department. <coughs> Stallman just thought Stallman Brothers asset management. And uh, Ruben and Freeman came to said, we made a mistake, you were right, we were wrong. We're leave research and uh, build us an asset management business like you built research. Uh, I'm, I'm a humble guy. I don't want to sound like, you know, my shit don't stink. Uh, I took over research. Goldman Research was done right. When I left the research department to start GCM, we were number one in II, number one in the financial world, which doesn't exist anymore, number one in Greenwich Research. And I competed also in the strategy category. I was number one for nine straight years in portfolio strategy. And I was ready for a new challenge, uh, and I made the mistake of saying yes. <laughs> and I say it with a big smile on my face, because it turned out, I learned six or nine months later, with Goldman's interest in asset management, was right for the firm, by the way, it's a great firm, uh, and my interests were different. I had this view of managing money and having alignment with the client's interest, and their view was go out there and start new products and capture assets, so they understood assets under management times fee equal revenue. And they're trying to build a big business, and I'm trying to build a money management uh, record. And so uh, the straw that uh, broke the cow's back or led to a change, I went to them. At the time, we were managing 20 billion, all money market funds which we uh, got from the ILA, which was an, an acquisition we made for nothing. That's a whole story in itself. Um, and we were earning $13 million a year at the partner charges, and which was a, a rounding error, even at that time, from Goldman Sachs. Goldman Sachs in uh, 1991 uh, earned like $1.8 billion. So I said, if I go out and raise $500 million in form of a hedge fund, and we go up 20%, I'll add 150% of the division's profits, a 2% increase in assets. Um, and they reluctantly went along initially. And then what happened, uh, I'm telling all the family secrets, which are probably relevant to you. Uh, one guy in the audience who appreciated and verify what you're saying. Uh, something called the Water Street Recovery Fund blew up on Goldman. This was a vulture fund run by uh, three partners at Goldman. And uh, basically, there was a guy in New Jersey, I think, uh, Bill Huff, uh, ran a general strike against Goldman saying these guys were using confidential information to lift bonds that were defaulted from high yield clients in the firm and uh, this is no good. And John Weinberg, salt of the earth, basically intervened, closed the fund down, gave the billion dollars back to the clients. The firm came to me and said the next the last thing we're doing now is getting the hedge fund business because you're going to wind up being short an investment banking client and firm the client will find out we have hell to pay. So you leave research and you build GC as a money manager, as a business manager, not as a money manager. And I credit my wife for 53 years for giving the right line. She said, how old are you going to be and how rich are you going to be before you do what you want to do? I didn't want to build a new business. I wanted to manage money. And so I retired from the firm. But I believe in the blessed oblige. I was a consultant for Goldman for over a year. And I was rewarded initially by them investing with me. Uh, and we had a great relationship. You know, it's a change firm now, but you know, change comes with size. Like, you know, maybe we can talk about that in a different question. But so anyway, I, I really just want to manage money. And uh, it was a good change, and uh, it worked for me. But I wouldn't be poor if I was still a gold man. I'd lose a good So you would, Dave, um, and you are. Um, bold decision, um, you know, leaving Goldman and starting on your own, but maybe, like you said, how rich or you know older you have to be to make that decision what would you give as advice to maybe some of the folks in the crowd that are thinking about starting a hedge fund with the looming you know fintech and technology different world we live in today i mean uh, you can't uh, assuming you're not rich uh, to me you got to have at least a hundred million dollars to make the, the switch but you know there are other things that enter into it i was extremely happy at goldman sachs i was not unhappy you know, uh, it, 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 a lot of things enter into it. You know, uh, how motivated you are to be your own boss. You know, uh, how much risk can you take? You know, when I left Goldman, I was at that time not by today's standards. I was a rich guy. You know, I was a partner for 14 years. I happened to just cleaning out my desk at the day, and I found my capital account statement for 14 years. And my first year, my capital account was 100 thousand dollars, and my 14th year was 44 million. Okay, uh, and then I had money outside of the firm. So I was a wealthy guy by those standards. Today, 
know, I marvel at it, you know. Uh, I'm a good war storyteller, but the good news is they're all true stories. Uh, I got a call from John Whitehead and John Weinberg on Friday of Thanksgiving weekend of 1976. Both great gentlemen, and Whitehead had a you know, biting sense of humor, and John said, we're sorry we're doing what we're going to do this way. You elected to take the day off. We're in the office working. I always took the Friday of Thanksgiving holiday to be with my family. I had two boys. And Whitey said, we're going to invite you into the partnership. Uh, uh, you're going to come in with a $50,000 salary and three quarters of 1%. And the firm had just completed the best year in its history. We're going to earn $40 million pre-tax. I take forty million times three quarters of one percent is three hundred thousand. Take the fifty thousand dollars salary and make three fifty. And Whitey said, "We hope you understand. You now have to start working. It's not like you were in company for the last nine years to get to where you got." And then, and then, period from nineteen seventy six to nineteen uh, uh, ninety one, the firm's profits, with only one relatively flat, small down year, went from forty million pre tax to one point eight billion. One flat to mildly down year was the year that the major firms in Wall Street got together and privatized uh, the oil company, I think it was, uh, British Petroleum. And uh, they got hooked on the block and they lost a big chunk of dough. Uh, but um, it, I was there for a great run. Um, and you know, part of life is luck. You know, when I, when I interviewed uh, um, in 1966, I, I graduated, as I mentioned, January 31, 67. I was interviewed for a job in 1966. In 1966, the Dow was roughly a thousand, and, uh, and uh, 16 years later, it was a thousand. Okay, uh, the firms that were interviewed in 1966, the, the old line about you can tell the height of Wall Street by the number of crumbling walls. Nobody thought that the market was at a high that would persist for 16 years. So uh, I had 16 job offers. Um, I was a very serious uh, package. I had a six-month-old kid. I was straight A's, Beta Gamma Sigma, Wall Street Journal Student Achievement Award, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And you know, as I was an attractive package, and I made the decision to go with Goldman. And Goldman wasn't the highest offer. And then, if you look back, uh, just to visualize what a tombstone looked like. You don't even have tombstones anymore. 1966, Goldman was one of the few firms in the business that, that remained one firm. You know, I could have gone to White Wells, Cool Lowe, Low Roads, Good Body, you name it. Uh, instead, I went to Goldman because I liked the people I met. So that was another good decision. Luck, call it luck, call it intuition, whatever you want. But uh, and I prospered. But, uh, I don't know if I answered the question. No, you did. You did. Uh, you started talking about um, hedge funds, entrepreneurial uh, appetite for it. Uh, I didn't leave Goldman to make a lot of money. You know, I, I left Goldman because I wanted to do something different. You know, uh, any Jewish boy, I was, a, uh, I think at the time, a 1.75% partner. The firm just completed a year of 28, of 1.8 billion. If you put 1.75, 1.8 billion, and that's $25 million. Now, you didn't get the money. You know, the firm pays your taxes, they give you charitable contribution allowance, and everything else pays in the firm. But, you know, I'm a very simple guy, you know. Once you get to 100 million, I, I, I say this with no sense of arrogance. Is I, I don't, I have respect for money, but it doesn't mean much to me because basically, once you get over 100 million dollars, you can figure out a life. Uh, you have more money than you ever you need, uh, unless you're an art collector. <laughs> if you're an art collector, you don't have enough money. Right? <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't collect art. I never saw the value proposition, which was a big mistake. My ah. partner, Bob Mnuchin, who I, we speak to three times a week, has an enormously valuable collection. And, but I can never see, and I'm never going to the Sotheby's. When I ran Goldman Asset Management, I owned 6% of Sotheby's, and I used to go to the auctions to monitor the investments. They got 15% at the hammer. And you go to the auction, you see your painting all black. The title is Black on Black, Three Million. <laughs> I, I, I don't get it. I don't get it. Or Cy Twombly with a little curl of you, you know, ten million. So, you know, but unless you're an art collector, there's only four things you could do with money when you think about it. There's a conclusion I reached 20 years ago. Number one thing you could do is you pleasure yourself and spend a lot of money. If you're not an art collector, unless you just get into frivolous things, you can't really spend the money on yourself. And, I happen to have a view that material possessions brings with it aggravation. 
So I'm not an accumulator of things. I like to keep my life simple. I have a house in Short Hills, I have a house in Florida. If it was up to me, I wouldn't have a house in Short Hills, but my wife says, I grew up in an apartment, I don't want to live in an apartment. We both grew up in the Bronx. I say, yeah, the apartment I was going to buy basically has indoor pool, outdoor pool, concierge service, fitness center. That's exactly where my wife grew up, right? In the South Bronx. So I, I can't get through to her, so here's what it is. I told my wife that I have no need for Google. After 50, 30 years, I've learned she knows everything. I don't need, I don't need Google. So the first thing you do with money is you pleasure yourself for spending on yourself. I'm not an art collector. I'm not a clothes horse for obvious reasons. Um, so I can't spend it on myself. The second thing you can do with money is you can give it to your kids. Now, I don't, think, I don't think it's wise to give, if you have a lot of money, give all your money to your kids and deprive them of some ability to become self-achieved. So I've given my son and my two sons more than they should have gotten, but not, no, nothing remotely to what I have. <coughs> the third thing you can do, <coughs> excuse me, is give it to the government in the form of taxation, but only a full me. Give the government money you don't have to give them. The best example is Warren Buffett. He talked about rich people not paying enough in taxes, but he runs a $250 billion enterprise and he takes a $100,000 salary and he's giving all his money away to charity, so he pays them low taxes. And the fourth thing you can basically do is recycle it back into society. And the reason I took the giving pledge is that's my major, major motivation. Um, talk a little bit about Omega and uh, the time that you've spent growing that and some of the, the challenges that you were previously up against and, you know. The challenges I were up against were not, nothing compared to what I did with the SEC, uh, which we'll get to, I'm sure. I don't mind that question. I just got to be careful how I answer it because they're, in my opinion, they're a, I don't want to say criminal enterprise, but they're basically, they are, they are basically, they are basically, um, they abuse their position um, and uh, they're very wrong-footed uh, in what they do. And I entered into what's called the no admit, no deny. I want to make that clear. I cannot say I'm innocent. They can't say I'm guilty. Uh, the facts speak for themselves. And if you ask me the question, I will give you the background. Uh, but I, uh, answers with no admit, no deny. But they take advantage of the system that exists, and you understand that by answer the question. No, oh, you want me to be able to, maybe I'll take it? Please. So, uh, again, I, all this has been written about, and if you really want to get into it, I'm happy to provide you all the stuff I've been writing. Um, I had a 10-year relationship with a company um, uh, that owned Atlas uh, Energy. The company I owned was called Resource America. <clears throat> I owned it from 2000, uninterrupted, to 2016, at a 16-year holding period. You got to assume I'm an investor, right? Within Resource America, they had a company called Atlas Energy, an energy company. That was one of the reasons I owned it, because it was an under that conglomerate that had a financial services business and had an energy business. In 2004, if memory serves me right, they sold 20% of the energy business to the public. I bought it on the deal. In 2005, they spun out the remaining 80% they owned tax-free. And as a large Rexy shareholder, I got my proportionate shares. I held that for seven years. That was an energy, I forget the year, maybe five years ago, <clears throat> was taken over by Chevron for cash. Along the way, Atlas Energy creates a new company called Atlas Pipeline, which initially I never owned. In 2007, my brilliant analyst, who I terminated later, <laughs> later nothing to do with legal things, recommended it, and it passed mustard. Our stock selection committee went along, and we put $100 million in on a pipe deal at 44 and three quarters. Because of my relationship with the Atlas company, Amexi, uh, and there was extra stock available, I was able to buy stock from my wife, my foundation, my youngest son was a scientist, knows nothing about the stock market, and myself. All at the same price of the firm, 44 and three quarters. Now to admit a colossally bad job of risk management, the stock went from 44 and three quarters in 2007 to $10 in 2010. I rode that piece of dung all the way down. <laughs> now, basically, again, common sense. Why do you hold something from 44 and three quarters to 10? It's because your analyst 
the management, the street, are telling you that the problems are overly discounted, the stock is cheap, and you hold on. In 2010, I get two new clients in. Industry best practices, you rebalance the new accounts into the inventory that you own, that you still like. And I buy $3.8 million worth of stock, with a 2.5% increase in the position size, only in those two new accounts. You have a bunch of accounts in the audience, you know, in the hedge fund business, you have your money in the partnerships and in the separate accounts it's the client's money. Not one entity in Omega that I have money in that I buy stock. The stock was bought in these two new accounts. My wife didn't buy a share, my son didn't buy a share, my foundation didn't buy a share. I actually did buy 50,000 shares, but I owned a million shares already. Okay? Um, we, we, were, uh, we were getting so hammered in the stock and I didn't know what to do. I was short options at $1.60 on 10% of the position size when the options went to a nickel, I covered them in a nickel, never went long an option. Okay, never went long an option. My son, who I was, uh, his largest investor by a factor of 10 in his hedge fund, was short the stock the day of the announcement. Short the stock. Okay. Good news comes out. Okay. I don't sell a share for 13 months. 13 months later, I eliminate the position at a $34 million loss selling it at a lower price than before the good news came out. Lo and behold, five years later, I get a subpoena from the SEC. I tell my uh, attorneys, tell the SEC, withdraw the subpoena, I'll meet with them, answer all their questions, and if they don't like the answers, they can reinstate the subpoena, they have nothing to lose. They refuse. I take uh, a number of months to respond to the subpoena, the millions of dollars of data collection costs, okay? Uh, they take a number of months to follow up, I took the high road, and what I mean by that is I notified my investors, I didn't have to legally, but I received a subpoena. This creates a level of anxiety, and the institutions start pulling out money. You know, I, 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 I'm not gonna make any value judgment. I mean, they're, they're nuts to have some fiduciary that doesn't do any homework, that basically they just run. They don't care about the facts. Um, I, I can let go there as well. And I lose $4 billion of assets, if you understand the one half and 20 business, probably worth $140 million a year. Finally, I'm going to get to the, the SEC comes uh, and my lawyer's telling me, look, you're ruining the man's business. Okay? Uh, he said, well, the SEC says, if you want to settle, we'll take a $10 million fine, a five-year bar from the industry, and effectively admit you're guilty. You still got to take the five-year bar unless you're guilty. I tell them they go F themselves. Okay? <laughs> I realize we have a reporter here. I don't care. Anything I say is on the record. The one thing I have to say is not on the record, so I gotta be careful. Uh, we haven't gotten to that point yet. I tell them to go F themselves, and I'll see them in court. Five months, this is the crusher, and I've written two letters to uh, uh, Clayton at the SEC with great respect, asking them to explain their behavior. Five months later, they come back after they destroy the business, no, significantly hurt the business, didn't destroy it, we're still in business. We have 3.6 billion, the trouble is 2.2 is our own, only 1.3 pays. Okay? They come back with no new information on their part, they say, okay, no bar, no admit, no deny, and give us 4.9 million, after they destroy the business, ruin the business. Okay? It was significant new information available, which is a privileged document I can't discuss which any normal person would say, it was a document the SEC had in their files, which undermined their entire case. Okay, so now my lawyer, who's a very fine guy, real gentleman, I have two of them, Ted Well and Dan Kramer, you know, uh, good guys, but you no, know, and they had Bill. Uh, <laughs> you know, Ted says to me, you won. Anyone who understands the business knows no admit, no deny, no time out, you won. Give them the 4.9 million. So if you don't give them the 4.9 million, we've got a trial, 90% probability you're gonna win. The 10% chance you don't win has nothing to do with the merits of the case. He says, the SEC has asked for a jury trial, okay? And you're basically a former Goldman partner. You're rich and you run a hedge fund. Those are not facts that play well with the jury. Give them the 4.9 million. So if you don't, we've got a trial. You're gonna win, but it'll take two years and 20 million to win. I gave him the 4.9 million. And the problem with the system, and I was rich enough and stubborn enough to put up with all the issues, 
The problem with the system is it's no losing party pays. If we had losing party pays in America like they have in the UK, I would have gone to trial. I could afford to take the risk of $20 million, okay, because I would get the money back. The government would have to pay my cost. The government has no cost of goods sold. They use taxpayer money to fund their picadillos, okay? And number three, they have sovereign immunity. I can't sue them. The two people that are most instrumental in my whole case are no longer at the SEC. They're in private practice. And that's their game. Their game is to try to bring down some of their reputation, take that accomplishment, get a job in the private sector, making a million dollars a year as a defense attorney. Now my story pales, I, you know, I tell you a story about Hank Greenberg, who I have enormous respect for. It. Hank built the most profitable insurance company in the world over 50 years of hard work. Major philanthropist, World War II hero. 12 years ago, he had the uh, New York State Insurance Commission goes after him. It's like the SEC, all these regulators are out of control, okay. And basically, uh, he said, look, there's nothing wrong with Dunn. I give you $16 million so we can get on with our lives. They said, no, no, we want billions. This is all a true story, by the way. He gave him permission to part. He said, he said, we want billions. He gave him the equivalent of effort, okay. In the next 12 years, he and the government spent $200 million on legal fees, and the final settlement was $9 million less he sold for $7 million, $9 million less than he offered him before $2 million was pissed away on legal fees. The system is out of control. I'll tell you one other story, two story. When I got out of Columbia Business School and started Goldman Sachs, I was lucky enough to get into a, an orientation session with Mr. Sidney Weinberg Sr., Mr. Wall Street, head of the War Production Board, uh, you know, major banker, you know, Mr. Wall Street, saved Goldman Sachs in the Great Depression. And I remember him saying during that orientation session that Goldman Sachs would never have, as a partner, an attorney who practices an attorney. They can get the best legal advice on the outside. He probably was an attorney that became an investment banker. Well, today I believe that Goldman has five partners that are full-time practicing attorneys and a compliance staff of over a thousand. That's the business we live in today. So we're talking about starting a hedge fund. Uh, I think, if, you know, Everything is processed now. You know, Madoff uh, moved that along. So you need a CFO, you need a chief operating officer, chief compliance officer. So it depends how you know unhappy you are in your current position, how talented you are. You know, everybody must have some golf club. Some people do it better than others, but you got to make that judgment. But I say it's a generalization. You need a hundred million dollars to be an economic uh, entity. My business loses money today. You know, it's unfortunate. Uh, uh, there's a they've created a serious issue for me. I'm rich enough I could deal with it. Because, see, I've not lost anybody in my firm. But you cannot, like the advertising business, you can't go from $7 billion to $3.5 billion and keep the same staff there. If, you know, if uh, Foot Cohen Delding loses General Motors, the, the team that's tied to General Motors is gone. Uh, I've not let anybody of any consequence go. And the reason I've not lost people is A, they believe in me, they believe in the firm's ethics, okay, which were proven out, but they understand. I tell everybody, no matter how the firm does, if you make money for the investor, you get paid. They get, they get roughly 5% of their p and In the past, I had a very profitable management company, which is a spread between the management fee and the operating cost, so the netting risk was absorbed by the management company. Today, my management company loses money because my overhead is greater than my everyday revenue. So the netting risk is absorbed by me. And so like, this is a typical year. You know, uh, the good news, the good decisions, the bad decisions all, you know, emanate from me. So we're up 300 odd million gross. My energy team is down 25 million. So I gotta pay the gross number of the center fee. I don't get anything back from the losses. So, you know, I'm, I'm really running my own capital, but you know we're very we were very devoted to the investors, but it's not a not a profitable business, you know. Uh, but the profit comes from the capital appreciation, which you could have by not having clients and just do your own thing. But that's I, I kind of love what I do, do what I love. I don't want to retire, and this is for well. Thank you uh, for the candid responses to the uh, SEC questions. Would you like? No, I'm fine. Do it I'm fine. Okay, thank you. Um, one question uh, related to regulatory is what can you give to the audience that maybe you would have done differently? Obviously, you feel you did nothing wrong, but is there anything, any advice you can give? The only thing I would have done differently is if the, 
I've asked the SEC, why, what did you know, learn from the original ask of a five-year bar and the effect of admission of guilt of a $10 million fine, no admit, no deny, no bar, and $4.9 million? Is that they made that offer originally. I'm no schmuck. I would have taken that offer even though I know I felt I did nothing wrong. Again, I, SEC, I understand, no admit, no deny. I don't want any aggravation from them. But I would have accepted that because I knew what I was facing. Okay, but you know, if you've done nothing wrong in your eyes and you believe you could prove it, you've got to hang in tough because at the end of the day, you, your reputation is most important. And so uh, what I would have done differently is nothing I didn't do. Look, the options, I wasn't long one option, went from five cents to three dollars. I have a couple hundred million dollars invested with my son. He short the stock. So it was clear I didn't say anything to him. No Anthony and Omega that I had capital bought the stock. My wife didn't buy, my foundation didn't buy, my son didn't buy it. All had the right to buy it. They owned the 40, 43 quarters. The stock was trading at 10. So, you know, um, the, what, what I learned is if you're 30 years old and have no money, you're fucked. You're out of business. <laughs> Even if you shouldn't be out of business. Excuse me. I'm sorry for the ladies. You know, it's, but you're screwed. <laughs> if you're 70, at that time I was 72, <clears throat> you know, it was interesting. Uh, this, these two conversations on the relate here happened 30 days apart. <clears throat> I get a call. <clears throat> uh, I'll take this. I get a call from Ken Langone, a man I have enormous respect for. Enormous respect for. Calls me up and says, "Lee, I've known you for 40 years. I've been investing in your fund for the last 10 years. I can only tell you the best 35 million dollars I ever spent in my life, and the 35 million dollars I spent defending myself against Elliot Spitzer. Don't give those bastards a dime if you've done nothing wrong." I said, Ken, it's precisely my view. <laughs> a month later, I'm at a Columbia Business School board meeting. I've been on the board for about 35 years. And a guy named Paul Ferry comes over to me, a venture capitalist up in Boston. So I read this, uh, your, your stuff about the SEC in the paper. Give them whatever they want and get rid of them. I said, the worst three years of my life, this is him talking, I said, an SEC problem, they just terrorized me for three years. Give them what they want and get rid of them. I said to him, you know, Ken Lango told me this a month ago. You tell me this. I'm with Lango. I'm with Lango. That's it, but you got each gentleman's bad to size. But, you know, if you feel you've done nothing wrong and you can prove it, then you have the financial resources. But if they made me a reasonable offer at the beginning, as Hank Greenberg did with the um, uh, New York State Insurance Commission, offering $16 million, and they said, no, we want billions, and they wound up getting $7 million, pissed away $100 million of taxpayer money and he spent $100 million of his own money, you know. It's, 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 a, it's a problem with the system. It's a problem with the system. And that's why I've written to Mr. Clayton, you know, basically, that, you know, it's, it's wrong. When I offered to sit down with him and answer all their questions, basically, they refused. It could have been a, a lot easier. So, hey, I'll tell you another story. Uh, you, you don't have time, let me know. I'm going I'm I'm to I'll tell you another story. So, finally, they guess he gets around, they want to meet with me. And Ted Wells says to me, uh, you'll meet with them, but we'll be advising you to take the Fifth Amendment. And I say, there's no effing way I'm taking the Fifth Amendment. It's nothing, everything I stand for, everything I believe in. And I have nothing to hide. Lee, you don't have a clue about what you're talking about. Now, this is a professional. He said, they're not interested in the truth. They're interested in finding a way of hooking you. And they'll find a minor point that you're wrong on, and they'll go after you on perjury. So I tell Paul Weiss, I am unprepared to accept your recommendations without independent corroboration, even though I'm paying the guys millions, right? And I go to two friends of mine. One's a sitting judge in Essex County, New Jersey, <laughs> And one was a U.S. attorney for seven years and then a major law practice in New Jersey. Social friends of mine. Both of which say, you got a terrific guy representing you, he's 100% right, listen to him, you must take the Fifth Amendment. I go back to my lawyers and I say, okay, you won this debate. I'm going to go into the meeting with the SEC. And I'm going to tell them, based upon your advice, and your advice, I mentioned two guys, I won't mention them here, you know, uh, uh, and Ted says, you can't say that. What do you mean I can't say that's the truth? Is that you can't say that because the moment you mention it and they become discoverable, they can be very unhappy because they're not involved in the case and not being compensated. I sort of get that, I tell. So I go into the meeting with the SEC and I put two books on the desk. 
One's called How Prosecutors Lie by Sidney Powell. <laughs> she was the U.S. attorney for eight years and wrote a book citing case after case that she was aware of where the government lied to get their verdict. The other one's called Three Felonies a Day by Harvey Silverblade, a Boston-based defense attorney. I said, after speaking to my attorneys, I didn't mention it to my two friends, and I'm reading these two books which basically say, if you're not interested in the truth, you're interested in finding a way of looking at me, I'm forced to take the Fifth Amendment, and I'll apologize in advance. And then he asked me 150 questions. I knew they answered every question called. But I said, based upon advice of counsel, blah, 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 blah. I felt like Al Pacino with the Godfather. <laughs> but basically, and the last question they asked me is, what can you tell us about stone crabs? My lawyer told me, I know exactly what to talk about. Probably 40 years ago, there was a guy in the options department at Goldman Sachs by the name of Richard Carrigan. He knows very little about stocks, but he's an expert in option pricing. He left Goldman 40 years ago, he lives in Malibu. I'm a very available guy, I like helping people. And he'd call me up every couple of months, so what, what am I involved in, what do I like? He happened to trade at Atlas. Every Christmas I send him a point set of plant for the holidays, he sends me two portions of Joe Stone crabs. They think for fifty dollars worth of fish, I'm going to be dealing. You know, I have a foundation that gives away about twenty million dollars every year. And for fifty dollars worth of fish, I'm going to sell my soul. But I didn't have any sense making it anyway. So, it just the, the whole thing is crazy. It's more than you want to do. No, that's excellent. Excellent. Um, you mentioned legal fees, millions. Um, how did insurance fare with that? I know there's a good amount of insurance that hedge funds can take on. I know a lot of people think about how they should uh, cover that exposure, if any. Look, the major cost, the major cost, for the last 26 years, I've compounded Omega's client money at 14% a year. Let's assume I compound at 10. No guarantee, right? I'm one and a half and 20. One and a half percent of four billion is 60 million dollars a year annual magnitude out the window. 20 percent and 10 percent of four billion is 80 million in centre fee. 80 and 60 is 140. That's 140 million dollars taken out of the pockets of 45 hardworking people who did nothing wrong. Forget me, I'm leaving myself out of that equation. So that's the main cost the uh, impact on the business profitability. Because, you know, if you're making investment decisions for a $7 billion fund as opposed to a $3.5 billion fund where 52% of money is, doesn't pay any fees because it's inside money, your earning opportunity has been vastly diminished. That's been the big impact. I think the out-of-pocket legal fees, I'm guessing about $6 million or $7 million. Um, again, they try to inflict pain on you. The SEC insists any settlement cannot be paid by insurance, you must pay it yourself. What's the hell their business who pays it? You know, they just try to really inflict pain on you. And uh, I told them three years ago, they're screwing around with the wrong guy in the wrong case. I showed them the picture, you know, I can show it to you, I have on my iPhone, my signature charitable activity. I, I, I paid college tuition for 500 kids in Essex County, New Jersey. If you uh, have a financial need unmet by government, you're academically qualified, you live in Essex County, New Jersey, you show the initiative and attend a free, three-week pre-college program by, designed by Franklin Marshall. I give you $10,000 a year for up to six years to get a college degree. This is life-changing because the lifetime earnings of a college graduate is well in excess of a million dollars more than non-college graduates. You're getting also self-esteem, et cetera. I have 500 kids I'm writing a check for. It. I tell the government, what you guys are costing me, I can send 2,500 kids to college. They didn't give a damn. They didn't give a damn. I showed them a picture of the kids. It is what it is. I probably said too much. I mean, God knows they're coming and they want to reopen the case. <laughs> part, of, part, part, part of me wouldn't object, to be honest with you, because I, would, I, I really feel at the end uh, I would win. But whatever. We don't want to go through that aggravation. Okay, on that note, we'll switch topics a little bit. We'll that's switch that's to good. you left gold in the game. you if I get in trouble. Okay. Well, uh, Tim. Um, if, if you really think about where you were back when you left Goldman, the mutual fund business is what they wanted to stay in, and, and you wanted to open a hedge fund for the obvious. Yeah, who wants mutual fund business? Let me just tell you something again. I mean, all these stories, they're all great people. I mean, the Weinberg family, uh, the salt of the earth. When I started the money management business, he sold the mutual fund. You go back and check the record. It was not, Goldman Sachs' name was not on it. It was called the GS Capital Growth Fund. 
John Weinberg said, look, my father saved us from the Depression. You know, if you read the, John Ken Galbraith's book, The Great Crash, chapter two was in Goldman Sachs We Trust, where Eddie Campus next Goldman every night on his radio program. And uh, John said, I don't want Goldman's name on this. Now you open up a newspaper, 26 <coughs> years later, there's probably 50 funds with Goldman Sachs' name on it. Okay, so it's a different world. But when we started, it was a GS Capital Growth Fund, not Goldman Sachs. So I'm sorry. No, no, the, the question was, and that's great insight, where do you see asset management going? You know, there's reports out that 24% of the total assets under management within the asset management sector are really, you know, uh, robo advising technology. With artificial intelligence, by 2024, the reports are it's going to be at 50%. Do you see with the margins tightening, do you see a change? In, in a world of low returns, these will be impacted. Is, I have a lengthy answer to your question. About a year and a half ago, I went to a seminar in, of all places, Palm Beach. I say of all places because the seminar title was Closing the Gap. It was focused on income disparity, which interests me and why I took the giving pledge. It was a futurist that spoke at the conference, okay, and before I tell you what he said, I love Warren Buffett's comments about forecasts of the future. He said, forecasts of the future tell you more about the forecaster than they tell you about the future. But this, for, this futurist said, he thought the biggest problem facing the economy in the next decade was 45% of all jobs being performed in the economy would be replaced by automation, okay, um, and there's no alternative employment for these displaced workers. I went home that night, I started to think about it. The equivalent of automation for our business is passive management. And it's got implications, not just for money managers, but for the brokers as well. Passive turnover is less than 5% a year. Active turnover averages 30% a year. If more money goes passive, less liquidity in the market, less ability to get things done, a big decline in the revenue available to the street to you know to sell their research. So they got to resize their efforts for a reduced revenue pool. And then you look at the money manager, you know, you can get an index fund for five, eight, ten basis points. You don't need a one percent mutual fund and you don't need a two inch one hedge fund for sure. So at the end of the day, where it all comes down to is can you deliver the performance that merits a premium fee? And I suspect that um, passive will Passive plays a role. Don't give me a big money. Passive plays a role, but so does active. And you know, at the end of the day, you know, Warren and Buffett can say what he wants to say. He gave ten billion to Wexner, ten billion to Combs, and he didn't get to be worth sixty billion by buying an index. Okay, it's more difficult now. Uh, I read something that in the last decade, the number of publicly traded companies in the United States have gone down by half. Okay, the number of hedge funds are up fourfold. We got four times more people looking at half the ideas, at least domestically. So it's a life cycle to the business. Okay, the golden period. I, I could pull out. I, I checked my file. I didn't bring it with me. Uh, an article I love showing people. The title of the article: Hard Times Come to Hedge Funds, written by one of the most distinguished reporters at Fortune magazine, Carol Loomis, who was co-authored or uh, helped Warren Buffett for 50 years of writing his annual report. You basically rang the bell for hedge funds. Hard times come to hedge funds. In 1970, when that article was written, in 1970, the largest hedge fund was Steinhoff, Fine, and Berkowitz at 49 million. The second largest was A.W. Jones at 30 million. The entire industry was less than a billion. Today is three trillion. So obviously, her timing, you know, for a year she looked right, and the timing was all wrong. The golden period for hedge funds was 2000 to 2007. They were outperforming the index. We're outperforming uh, uh, conventional money managers. Money was coming in over the transom. CNBC publicized all these guys. <coughs> okay. Then all of a sudden, 2008 hits. And even though hedge funds, in my opinion, lived up to their billing, the average hedge fund in 2008 was down 16%. The S&P was down 35%. But a lot of people went into hedge funds not knowing what the hell they were doing. They thought there was a license to make money. There's a question of how much money they're going to make, not thinking they were taking risks. <coughs> so there's a rash of redemptions. Parenthetically, I think hedge funds hurt themselves because many of them either closed up and didn't honor a high watermark, which I think is a moral obligation of the manager. You know, it's one thing if a somebody, client says, I want my money back. Another thing if you say, I'm retiring, here's your money back, I don't want to do this anymore. 
And they love doing when they were up 30 percent. They don't love doing when they get to work just for magic thing. And in any case, they gave the capital. But I'm not blaming anybody. But I would just make an interesting observation. Okay, everybody in 2008 financial crisis, they were blaming the banks. They were blaming the brokers. They were blaming the insurance companies. They were blaming the government. How much responsibility does the individual have to manage their financial affairs properly to make sure they're not overextended? So similarly, in 2008, the people that elected to remain in hedge funds said, I want an absolute return manager. I want a manager to protect my capital when things go bad. If I told, and we were probably more right than most, my partner Steve Einor, and, you know, he leads that macro effort, does a fabulous job. We've been pretty damn bullish since 2009. If I told you or some prospective investor we're going to be in the best bull market in history, and we're going to be a nine-year economic expansion, they would probably lock me up and throw them away the cake. <laughs> so the people elected to be in a hedge fund in 2008 said, I want to be in an absolute return vehicle. You've been in a trended bull market. If you're running a hedge, you're less than fully invested. You're investing with people who have their own money at risk. You know, I have a very large number in my fund. And, you know, uh, I'm not motivated by my investment per se. I'm motivated by trying to do the best job for my investors. But, you know, we're dealing with a reasonably fully priced market, lots of issues. You know, next time North Korea launches the missile, maybe we shoot it down. What does the market do? The market seems to think that Gary Cohn or uh, General Kelly leave the administration. That's going to be a big problem. You know, there's a lot of issues out there. Uh, and so, you know, uh, you cannot keep up with an index when you're in a trended bull market, unless you're in leverage and you go up with a little ball to the wall. So I think what's going to have to happen is the trend towards passive will continue until the next bear market. Just like in 1987, portfolio insurance. You know, people increase their equity exposure to some mathematician sold them a bill of goods that if you insure your portfolio, you won't get hurt. And we had the 22% decline in one day. You don't have that kind of an overvaluation. In fact, then the multiples were 25 and interest rates were 9. Uh, we're, the bubble today is not in equity. The bubble today, in my opinion, is in fixed income. And where fixed income yields are, they've been basically pushing everybody out of the risk curve. So the people that never wanted to take risk and bought T-bills exclusively, like our good friend Gary, basically, they said, I can't survive on zero. I'm going to take duration risk, and I'm going to buy a T-bond. The T-bond buyer says, I can't get by in 2%, I'm going to buy an industrial credit. The industrial credit guy says, I can't get by in 4%, I'm going to buy high yield. The high yield guy says, ah, 6% doesn't impress me, I'm going to buy structured credit, which is a more opaque market. But the structured credit guy says, well, I'm going to put a provision in my fund that I can put 25% in equities. So we're all moving on the risk curve, and until that reverts, and you need a reason. You see, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a pessimist, I think the market is basically okay. You know, it's fully valued, but not overvalued. And, you know, the, the greatest comment, one of the great comments, uh, was by John Templeton, who observed the arc of a market cycle. He said, bull markets are born in pessimism, they grow in skepticism, they mature in optimism, and they die in euphoria. Pessimism ended in 2010. Uh, skepticism has ended. We are clearly in optimism, but I think there are very few signs of euphoria. You know, uh, market multiples about 18, high against history, but <coughs> not high against 2% uh, tenure governments, 1% Fed funds. And then you have this situation where you got the president advocating his tax package. That tax package is worth $10 in S&P earnings. Put a 15 multiple and that's 150 S&P points. So, you know, I've never seen a stock up without a reason, I've never seen a stock down without a reason. It's my job to figure out whether the reasons are credible. But um, I'm sorry. No, no. No apology. We're going to um, stop with my questions, and we're going to open it up to the audience for some questions, yeah, if you don't yeah, mind. Good question. I don't have any questions left, but we'll go ahead. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah, Mr. Cooperman, you, oh, you, you spoke before uh, about your relationship with Warren Buffett. Uh, one of the things that you did mention is that you never invested in Berkshire Hathaway. I want to take you back to your thought process because I'm sure you know you're in the investment. I, must, I didn't think. Let me tell you exactly. <laughs> the biggest mistake I made in 1982, August to be precise. 
I get a letter from Warren Butler. What occasioned the letter was, Business Week had my hero pictured on the cover as the mythical uh, Icarus flying too close to the sun whose wax wings melted and craft earth. And a picture of Henry Singleton, the founder of Teledyne, on the cover. I was an enormous fan of Singleton, the smartest guy I ever dealt with. And I could prove it, okay. Uh, the man is in a class by himself. I can spend 20 minutes talking about him. Business Week writes this ridiculous article picturing him on the cover, highly critical. I write a 14-page letter to Business Week, three sentences got into the letters to the editor, three sentences. Buffer got a hold of the letter and sends me a letter. Dear Lee, I always enjoyed by the, both the quality of your writing and the quality of your thinking. Your letter to Business Week retailed on with 100% of the mark, best regards warrant. I took the letter, I framed it, it's been hanging on my office wall for 35 years. And I tell people that my biggest mistake is I thought so well of it in 1982, why the hell was I such a schmuck I didn't buy a stock? <laughs> and now I can't buy it because his accolades, which are all deserved, you know, basically are so outstanding that the stock can't be undervalued. But that's just a, you know, I, I, I traffic more in the world of the undiscovered rather than the discovered. But uh, it was a mistake. You know, contra, uh, the guy that was absolutely brilliant in the essence of good investing, I believe Sandy Gottesman has about three or four billion dollars, first Manhattan fella, in, um, uh, he was a partner in the original Berkshire Fund, Buff Buffett Partnership, when Buffett dissolved it, he took his interest in Berkshire Hathaway and stuck with Warren. And, uh, you know, Warren took a nothing invested, made very worth four billion. That's the essence of investing, find a smart jockey, you know, make it better than the guy, and uh, make sure he's properly compensated. But Warren is undercompensated, but it serves his purpose, which is what he owns in the company. But it was a mistake. Mistake. You know, we make it. We make them. Behind you. So I'll leave this a little bit open ended, but uh, do you have an opinion on bitcoins or alternative coins or blockchain? Zero. Zero. I, I have a, a, a tremendously high regard for Jamie Diamond, and so I suspect he knows what he's talking about. Uh, I have a bad end to it, but I, I know nothing about it. I don't understand it. I've not really looked into it. I'm like an old fashioned guy, you know. But no, I don't know anything about Bitcoin. Sorry. Thanks so much. I saw in the Bloomberg interview that you did with uh, Tom Keene that you noticed in the ADP debate with Bill Ackman. You noticed that the board member that Bill Ackman was going to appoint was 71 years old, and there's a statutory limit of 72 on the board. I was kind of more curious about your thought process on discovery for new investment ideas such that that's not like the that's not a detail that would be top of mind when I'm doing my No, that wasn't the essence of, well, let me explain something, and I say this for the record. What Bill Ackman is doing is disgraceful. I have no axe in the fight. I retired from the ADB board after 20 years serving on the board. I gave all my stock to charity. I don't own a share. But you got to understand, this is one of the great corporations in America. Coming in public in 1961, with a market capitalization of maybe $15 million. Okay? If you take the two spin outs, Broadridge and CDK, the uh, automobile dealership company, and ADP, those three companies today worth almost $60 billion. $15 million in 61 to $60 billion in 2017 is a compound return of 17%. The company earns 40% on equity, the S&P earns 16% on equity. The company has a debt-free balance sheet, the S&P has 40% debt in their capital structure. The return on capital is materially better, ADP. The company's paid out 60% of their earnings in the form of dividends. They have bought back billions and billions of dollars of stock materially below the current price. They have outperformed their competition. Now he's got a, 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 and I'm not, by the way, commenting about his ideas. Bill's a bright guy. I respect Bill. I don't respect what he's done here. So, and I know exactly what went on. He called me up before all this was public, trying to elicit my assistance. He called me up and said, I spent six months studying the company. They have to, you know, institute significant improvements. I'm not ready to present to the board. The nominating committee window 
closed in 10 days. I want them to extend it for 30 days. I said, the chance of that happening is zero. Okay, who do you think you are? Number one. Number two, if you spend six months going to the company, why didn't you time it such that you could make your presentation to the board? So why don't you take the next year to meet with this company? They're very shareholder friendly. They're not an insular company. They will meet with you, make your recommendations, and if you find they stonewall you or they don't give you an acceptable response, then a year from now, do your proxy fight. Not now. You can divert management, you can run up a bill. It's uncalled for. If I could find more ADPs to invest in, this stock was 27, 28 times earnings. The market was blessing it. This is not a company you go after. This is not so un some underachieving insular company. So it's wrong. So the 71 was just an example of how much work you did because it was a mandatory retirement age of 72. Uh, but that, that wasn't my, 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 my point was noblesse oblige. This company has done a great job. They don't deserve to be put through. Now his idea, which I, uh, I'm not an expert on, I'm off the board now for five years, I think is wrong. He says paychecks has profit margins up here, ADP's profit margins are down here. But ADP and paychecks are in a different business. Paychecks is down market, small companies, highly computerized. ADP has large national and international accounts which require a high touch business. So they have more cost of money in their business, but their return on equity is enormous at 40%. So, I just think there's a better way of doing this rather than doing what he did. That's my view. So it's more not arguing the merits of his idea, but his deportment. Maybe it's because he's had some problems in the last couple of years and he wants a little bit of publicity. Uh, yeah, who the hell knows who makes people. I think less publicity the better, but yes, sir. Um, a quick, a quick question. Sorry, a, a quick question. Uh, when we meet afterwards and you hear my last name, and many of you will know, I have a reason for asking this question, specifically on that topic of, uh, of what you just described. It really comes down to a long-term versus a short-term perspective. There's quick money to be made in such an action as these activists occur, uh, take, but that's what's your really last name? What's your last name? It begins with a D, and we'll leave it there for a minute. But, but, but what is your, how do you balance that? Um, well, I, I think... Uh, I'm going to piss the guy off who I uh, love. He's a dear friend of mine. Activism is one at a time. There's good activism, bad activism. So what's an example of good activism? Uh, I, I will cite a time now. It must be 15, 18 years ago. Barry Rosenstein, who I helped mentor when he was at war, and called me up. <coughs> he says, can you introduce me to Carl Icahn? I have an idea, and I'd like to get his assistance. They wanted Kerr-McGee to forward sell oil in the market because the stock was undervalued, take the proceeds from the forward sales and do a major cap shrink. He goes to Icon, presents the idea, Icon likes the idea, and both Janet and Icon go after Kerr-McGee. Kerr-McGee says, no, we're not going to do it. Halfway through the proxy fight, Kerr-McGee sees they're losing, they fold, they do a big self-tender. One year later, they come back and say it was a very good thing we did, and they voluntarily, without any pressure, do a second self-tender. Two years after the second self-tender, they sell the company to Anandarko for a price. They say, we never could have gotten, never could have gotten, if we did not shrink the cap dramatically. So good activism. The activists win, management wins, the shareholders win, intelligent. And I can give you an example where he did stupid activism, but I'm not gonna go there because we're, we're, we're friends. So you got to look at activism one at a time. As a generalization, I would say activism is more good than bad, but it's a late cycle phenomena. The hedge funds, uh, investors are having trouble making money, they're trying to make their own luck by banging on companies. And some of the things I think are foolish and are uncalled for, it's ultimately going to lead to unwarranted and unneeded regulation. You know, it's like when Saul Steinberg went after the banks, you know, in the 60s. The, the world change. So I, I'm not a fan of it, uh, um, you know, uh, but I understand it, and it, some of it is good. Because, you know, managers are abusive, you know, and managers general. The biggest problem I have as an investor, to be honest with you, is I quote Buffett. He says, the compensation consultants hired by the boards go by the name of Ratchet, Ratchet, and Ratchet. <laughs> you know, uh, a guy I know who almost ran it coming to the ground, they gave him $50 million to go away. You know, it's just a tough thing. So I, I would say it's a one-off thing. I'm not, you know, negative on it, but I think it's self-serving. And one of the things the investors should understand, you know, 
I had a disaster with the SEC at $4 billion in withdrawals. Every withdrawal was met for cash, no gating. You go into a hedge fund that's buying 15, 20% of a company, you can't get your money back. You know, and so you gotta understand the nature of the, of the money manager you're investing with. But uh, activism is complex, but I'd say probably more good than bad, but you gotta be very careful. I think you wanna go to work, right? You well, leave. <laughs> um, thank you, Michael, and especially Lee. This was really an incredibly uh, entertaining, interesting, intriguing event. So let's give uh, Lee Cooperman a round of applause.